everyone takes their seats. I feel like saying welcome back because this is the first talk that we're having um, this year. So thank you so much all for joining us tonight for our talk, Design, Dialogue, and Democracy. So for those of you who don't know, my name is Melissa Wolfert. I'm the founder and director of the Museum of Architecture. The museum is dedicated to improving the public's understanding of architecture and for helping architects to be more entrepreneurial. So I'd like to also say thank you very much to the Built Environment Trust for hosting us here tonight. And um, I just wanted to explain a little bit more about the programming. So every year we choose a theme, and last year was health, well-being, and architecture. So some of you might have come to some of those talks, but our theme this year is on citizenship and architecture. Now we started thinking about this in March, sort of before Brexit, before the US election, um, just thinking about what potential turmoil was ahead. Little did we know at the time how relevant this sort of conversation would be. So um, I wanted to just mention kind of how we're going to go about creating this, this uh, program. So we're going to start today by trying to define what architecture and citizenship means. And then throughout the course of the programming over this year, we'll look at the different scales of citizenship. So working from the citizen to family, community, city, uh, country, and then going global. And we'll be doing this through a series of talks, panel discussions, debates, commissions, um, and an exhibition and workshop. So we're doing a little bit more this year than we did last year. And some of the questions that we'll be looking at are things like, how does the built environment impact our perception of being a community in the current context of greater urban migration and global citizenship? How does density, diversity, publicity, cultural vitality, and political power shape our sense of citizenship through the very physical manifesta manifestation of the built environment? How does access to housing, healthcare, education, culture, political life, and the public sphere constitute key elements of how individuals shape their feeling of belonging? These questions and more will be talked about sort of through this coming year, and we look forward to engaging with you. We'd also like to say that we're very open to collaboration and there's a lot more opportunity to do other things. So if you have a great idea, please do come forward and, um, and share that with us, and perhaps we can help you bring that to life. Um, I also want to mention some of our upcoming talks. We have one on the 13th of February called Who Are We Designing For? And that's a bit like a Petra Kucha. Um, when we talk about the public, who is that public? So we'll be trying to um, talk a little bit more about sort of who those people might be, um, and that's, there's about five different speakers speaking for that. And then we have another talk, which is actually going to be a debate on the 27th of February called Does User Involvement Create Better Design? And that is, uh, they both are going to be taking place at Future Cities Catapult. So now I'd like to introduce the speakers for this evening. Um, Adam Casa. Adam is the director of Theatro Mundi at LSE Cities and a research fellow in architecture at the Royal College of Art. He trained as a historical sociologist and his research focuses on the politics of the city and how they touch ground in the practices of architecture and urban planning. Adam will discuss his project, Designing Politics, which is a three-year project from Theatrum Mundi, organized around an annual ideas challenge in a different city, inviting residents to consider what it would mean to design for a political ideal. The aim is to think through the limits of design into the politics of the city. Compelled by recent political events, the talk then turns to consider where the public sphere for architecture might be, and if materials are more political than words. Next we'll have Maria Giaducci, and now Maria earned her PhD from Delft University in 2014. Her thesis, The Street as a Project, um, is the space of the city and the construction of the modern subject, is a critique of the contemporary idea of public space and an attempt to rethink the void between the buildings as the object of political and architectural intentions. Elsie Awusu is a Ghana-born female architect, a founding member of the first chair of the Society of Black Architects, a specialist conservation architect. Her projects include the UK Supreme Court, London's Green Park Station, and pan transport projects in Ghana and Nigeria. Elsie is vice chair of the London School of Architecture, and she runs her practice and, uh, and is vice, uh, sorry, Elsie Awusu Architects and is vice chair of the London School of Architecture. And she'll be talking about a palimpsest of bravery, architecture and citizenship, diversity, design, dialogue, and democracy. 
Um, last but not least is um, Asif Khan, who runs an award-winning architecture studio in London. He studied at the Bartlett and the Architectural Association, graduating in 2007, and he'll be sharing some of his projects and how they relate to the topic. So without further ado, I'd like to please ask Ada, Adam to the stage, please. Thank you very much. Great. Uh, well, thanks, Melissa, for the great introduction. Um, and thanks, Johanna, also for, uh, for helping organize and host this event. Much appreciated. And also, I'm really looking forward to the discussion with um, such esteemed panel members and hope I can contribute something to uh, how we might uh, go forward thinking the architecture of citizenship uh, with all of you here tonight as well. Um, I'll foreground saying I'm not an architect. Um, so my kind of contribution might be slightly different um, since I'm not grounded in a, in a pedagogy of, of design practice and thinking, but I think about it a lot, um, and I now work at an architecture school, and so I'm privileged to kind of be around uh, people who have. So I've, I've learned a lot, but, but bear with me as it might be a slightly different uh, conversation. Um, so I was preparing for today, and uh, as M Melissa mentioned, I'm going to speak a little bit about a project um, that I am uh, part of called Teatro Mundi, which broadly speaking has a, an ethics of bringing people from the visual and performing arts in dialogue with people from the built environment disciplines. And within that, a project we've run called Designing Politics. And over the weekend, and I was kind of preparing and um, living with the kind of uh, growing anxiety of different kind of contemporary world events and the echo chambers of, of, of Facebook and other social media, um, I began to think through really what we might be talking about today and thinking through the implications of how and, and, and what we might be talking about today. And um, uh, this list, which I'll just kind of run in the background, um, as I'm talking, was kind of pinged out by a friend of mine, Jesse Darling, uh, just pointing out some kind of nonviolent modes of engaging with politics. And it's a, a great list compiled by the Albert Einstein Institution. It's 198 nonviolent acts. Um, and it was kind of uh, assembled so that if you, you know, can't get out in the street, you have mobility issues, if you uh, aim at politics is, uh, from very different angles, no matter your political stripes, there are ways to kind of get involved. And this is kind of a, uh, was inspiring to me for some, for some reason this weekend. And it, I, I, I stand with it for two reasons today. One, because within the concept of design, democracy, and dialogue, to show some kind of solidarity with the grander political ethos that's at work uh, tonight in various parts of the world and, 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 and uh, will continue, I'm sure, uh, from very different political stripes. But two, also, if the aim is to think about and define, in some ways, these two terms, architecture and citizenship, um, and we hold, maybe as a starting ground, the definition that the OED gives us, where citizenship has kind of two, two frames. One, it, it, it tells us, is a synonym with nationality. So that legal framework uh, wha that uh, gives you the right to live and work, uh, be in society and be taxed. Uh, or its compounded for form, uh, a good citizen, good citizenship, active citizenship, bad citizenship, signaling a kind of engagement with society. So it's either a legal concept or a notion of engagement. And if we stand with that second definition of legal engagement, uh, then I was minded of the architectural historian Katie Lloyd Thomas's work that tries to bring specification uh, into the language and definition of architecture as a primary space that architectural politics and labor happens. Then I started to think of this list as possibly um, a, a specification list of the architecture of citizenship. Not architecture in the sense of a building, but the architecture in terms of its verb form of, of making or creating citizenship. And this might be one set of specifications and we might have many others about what it means to or can mean to uh, architect that compound verb of, of citizenship practice. So it's gonna run in the background. It's also gonna time me because it's 198, so I gotta go quick. And um, you can come in and out of my words and come in and out of the list as you go, and, and perhaps it might be useful. So Designing Politics was a three-year project uh, and uh, began with uh, a, a set of conversations in New York um, out of the Occupy movement that was trying to think with and athwart um, the politics of public space in that city. And uh, out of that group came this notion that if you can design out the possibility of assembly, through legal or, or formal terms, what would it mean to ask those same designers who might be over-designing space so that assembly is impossible or, or actively demolishing it to design for free speech? What would it mean to design 
toward a political ideal. Also, what kinds of complications are brought forward when you are asking to design for politics and not imagine that politics will happen irrespective of your intentions and design? How does that sit with the intentions of designers, with responsibilities of citizenship and public space? And what does this question start to enliven about the possibilities and or limits of design in respect to political questions? So we did that in New York uh, in 2014. Uh, it was on the kind of um, the, the architecture of an architecture competition. And so we invited submissions from interdisciplinary teams made up of architects, designers, but very much in Teatro Mundi's ethos, also with performers and visual artists to really think this through. In its second iteration, we came to London, which is where our second base is, and we asked a similar question. And here, it drew on the UK's long history with commoning and the commons. And we asked, can you design for the urban common? What would that mean? What would this, what does it look like? Knowing that commoning is mostly a process of labor, laboring brings the common into commons, where does design fit within that history and within its present reiteration across Southern Europe and, and in this country as well? In 2016, we were lucky enough to partner with colleagues in Rio de Janeiro. And there, a set of seminars and discussions brought forward a very different concept. Uh, and the question in Rio de Janeiro was, uh, can you design for respect? And it sat in some kind of contradiction because respect also has a very conservative background, the notion of respectability, uh, the notion of respect for authority, and how that lands in different spaces, societies, or continuities of history um, has very different kind of meanings. But somehow, what came through, especially during 2016 and the political events in Rio de Janeiro, was the notion of respect as a democratic ethos, respect for democratic institutions, not just the superficial respect for difference or respect for uh, tolerance in the city. It became about infrastructure, it became about geographies and the imagined city and who's part of that. Uh, it became something quite different. Out of these, we're now just starting to look back at these near 200 submissions uh, from three different continents, three different questions, to try to understand something that all these teams and their labor is telling us about where they think uh, design can do work and what they might be telling us about the limits of design in the face of politics. And I'll mention now three tensions that we're starting to uh, tease out in more detail. The first is a tension between form and social. So the age old relationship of uh, physical determinism and its relationship to our social subjectivities and bodies. And wondering uh, where is the process of agency within that co-constitution of the material and the social. The second was a tension between scale and complexity. And this arose primarily because the vast majority of our uh, submissions were small interventions, might, were temporal interventions, uh, dealt with uh, performativity uh, and transience, and weren't master planning or structural interventions. So we got a lot of critique from a large number of people, suggesting that the whole ethos was maybe naive, uh, that these projects can't scale up, and that very different approaches are required for the scale of global urban problems today. And we started to wonder, is the only meaningful way to think about uh, an intervention, its replicability uh, in kind of vertical scale, to scale up? And what do you lose when that happens? And is there an inverse relationship between scale and dwindling ability to deal with the complexity and the granular and the specific. The third uh, is a question about the relationship between democracy and expertise. And here very much is this longstanding thought process about what the right moment for a democratic ethos is within the process of design. We have a long history of participatory design and participatory consultation and uh, in this as well was uh, a, a, growing, a growing question mark about how we're dealing with that today. And um, especially with language changing, uh, with expert moving to elite, moving to out of touch, moving to misrepresentation and democracy, moving to public and people and mass and trust. How do those terms start to sit? And how can we, within this tripod of design, dialogue and democracy, start to think about that relationship particularly for design and architectural professions and or professionals and how they think about their work in the world. 
so we're at the end. And I wanted to close just with um, a final thought. And it's perhaps a thought to think if we understand all architecture to be political and if our small project designing politics aim of articulating an intentional design was meant to make visible that politics, then where as a set of professions uh, is uh, the public sphere? If public sphere theory is one about communicative action, if it's one about relationship of discourse and language, where and how does that sit within uh, materiality and within uh, the possibility of a material public sphere? So that's the final question and I look forward to discussing with you all. <laughs> thank you, Adam. Thank you, obviously, Melissa and Rihanna, actually, for uh, having me today here. And I think, actually, the last question with which you close your presentation is a question that is very close uh, uh, to the work that I do together with my partner, Pier Vittorio Aureli, uh, at the Architectural Association. So what I would like actually to show you uh, tonight uh, are a few student projects uh, that we developed in the last uh, four or five years. Uh, I think it's important that they are student projects because what we are trying to do with our students is to try to put forward uh, forms of political imagination maybe, but through spatial imagination, thro so through experiments with space. So um, in fact, uh, actually what I'm going to show you today are four ideas uh, on the space between the buildings, so the street, but are in fact actually um, eight projects. And I would like actually to start from this image, uh, just to say that I think there is something that is quite unique about the space of the street uh, in the European city, uh, and it has to do with the fact that at this moment in time in the Middle Ages, the right to citizenship was linked to the ownership of a house, which meant that the house really became, uh, uh, in a way, the embodiment of the right of one person to citizenship. Uh, and that, of course, uh, put a lot of weight on the architecture to express that link, but also that agonism and that friction between the public domain uh, and the person. And it was something actually that animated uh, the, uh, the logic, uh, physical and political of the European city for a few centuries. Uh, we have this very famous comparison that Colin Rowe made in his book, Collage City Between the Medieval City, in which in fact the tissue is so tight because the interests, the ambitions uh, uh, of the individuals and the interest and the ambition of the community at large are always in this kind of constant friction. Uh, contrasted obviously with the modernist city on the contrary, where the space of the infrastructure is more and more and more and more detached from the buildings. Almost as if actually to buffer or to avoid the risk uh, that the individual and the collectivity, uh, the, the citizen and the state might enter. Uh, this kind of uh, uh, conflict or this kind of friction that I don't think it's entirely uh, a negative friction because it's also the place where we as individuals are represented, right? I mean, we are a society, but this society is made of individuals. And I have the feeling, uh, and I think I'm not uh, alone with this, that actually since we started this kind of strategy in which actually the space of infrastructure and the buildings, uh, so architecture on the one side and the city on the other side have started to detach from each other, also juridically um, and uh, uh, politically, but also in terms of design, we have lost something that is actually quite important. We have lost that kind of imagination that allowed us to come, um, to come together into uh, the design of spaces, uh, we can call them public spaces perhaps, uh, where that right of citizenship is, uh, um, is embodied, embodied, is shown, uh, and is somehow also continuously negotiated. So what we tried to do actually with our students uh, uh, was to see if we could put forward uh, new archetypes perhaps, uh, new types uh, of uh, uh, street space, which is a challenge admittedly because that's something that as architects we don't really do today. We do either projects for the public uh, as, um, let's say, as client or for private, uh, but we very hardly ever in fact actually try to work in that kind of very thin crack where the interests uh, and the ambitions of the individuals uh, uh, in a way have to encounter the interests and the individuals of uh, uh, the collectivity. So that's actually what I would like to show you today. And my four main thesis actually I hope will, you know, initiate some kind of dialogue on four topics that I think are very important when we talk about the space between the buildings. We could define it as public space, but I think that that's a question that is up for discussion. Uh, and I would like to do that through, uh, in fact, actually these eight projects that all put forward uh, uh, models uh, of open air shared space uh, that somehow stages this kind of negotiation between individuals and, uh, uh, and the state ultimately. 
So my first thesis really has to do with agonism. Uh, so on the idea that the street really embodies this dialectical relationship between citizens and states. And here I think for me really the key word is actually dialectical. No? It's a relationship that is in a way never solved because it always has to do with this kind of push and pull of different uh, interests, let's say. And I do really seriously think that is in exactly in that agonism uh, that the vitality of the, the space of the street or public space actually resides. So it's in, it's in actually having this kind of uh, positive tension in a way. So the first project is a project for Athens. Uh, it's a project that actually sees the state uh, as, main, uh, um, as main agent uh, somehow. It's a project that in fact sees uh, a kind of resolution to the extremely fragmented character of the city center of Athens, a city that was born out of pure uh, kind of speculation, very aggressive speculation in fact. And it's a project that seeks to imagine what happens if in the middle of the crisis, the state, uh, instead of actually cutting uh, any involvement in infrastructure, would give back something to the city and would invest on the city, would invest in the public domain, would invest in the built domain, in fact, uh, by building something that is very simple, this kind of pergola structure on the main streets of the city. What would happen is that all of a sudden we could close the existing porticos uh, and maybe use them for productive activities, uh, something that is desperately needed in this moment in, in Athens, what with the economic crisis, uh, but at the same time staging this kind of covered uh, open air space uh, where maybe new forms of, again, social imagination, occupation, uh, but also encounters actually could happen, potentially with you know, first floor extension. So it's actually a very simple, very cheap project, uh, but that would seek again to construct an idea of publicness uh, that is very clearly lacking right now uh, in, the, in the tissue of central Athens. The second project is also a project for Athens, but that takes a completely opposite uh, uh, agenda. So imagines what happens if, on the contrary, it's us, the citizens, uh, who try to, again, look for uh, a way to overcome fragmentation, but from the bottom up somehow. So in fact, it's an idea where out of this whole mess of fragmentation, we actually can recognize that the structure of all these houses uh, tectonically is always the same, pillars and cores. What happens if we empty out completely our ground floors, we kind of decide consciously that we need that kind of uh, shared domain. We repave it uh, and we transform it into something that in the long run can become a new form of living the ground floor of the city. Not anymore with commercial aims, uh, but with aims that have to do with, again, with social interaction or potentially rentable spaces for startups, uh, for you know, young entrepreneurs and so on and so forth. So it's really an idea in which actually uh, we take away in order to create that stage for, for the shared domain or for the common that actually Adam was, uh, uh, was suggesting before. It can be a piecemeal operation, it can start very small, but eventually, we think uh, it can also almost like reveal what is common to all the buildings in the city of Athens that is exactly the same tectonic device, ultimately the same economy. And potentially imagine actually spaces that are not yet scripted where a lot of things that actually we don't even know yet might happen in the future. My second thesis has to do really with the nature of the space between the buildings as infrastructure. And I do believe that the street is a political sp space in virtue of the fact that it is an infrastructure, not in spite of it. I think this is quite important because often we talk about infrastructure as something that is a given. So the idea is, uh, you know, it just serves a purpose. Uh, and that means that in fact, the more we make it a technical fact, the less of, of a political fact it would be. But I think it's exactly the opposite. The street is a political space precisely because it's our right uh, to uh, movement, to being able to move from A to B, to being able to offer our labor force when we go to work in the morning. So in fact, the two things actually really should come together. And the first project is a quite provocative project actually by a student who uh, really wants to actually give a, um, a horizon to an area that is very contested right now, that is the Euphrates uh, Basin. Uh, you will all know that, of course, this is an area that is now contested because of the Syrian war. But of course, he's already looking forward. What will happen actually the moment that a kind of degree of democracy is going to be reinstated here? What kind of spatial archetype can we really offer to this corridor that is a very thin strip of fertile land uh, dotted by villages left and right of the Euphrates? Uh, so he is imagining actually the Euphrates as a new infrastructural backbone and as a way to offer some kind of degree of readability to these two kind of infrastructural lines uh, left and right of the, uh, of the river. Imagining that maybe ONGs uh, or you know, whoever is going to go there and try to reconstruct some kind of pro form of service for these people who are already there, instead of dotting actually these villages with services, uh, we'll try maybe to concentrate these services on the spine in order to construct this kind of uh, potential interaction between different settlements. And 
Again, a bit like in the first case, of course, this is like a top-down project. Uh, so the idea here is that somebody might want to intervene and might want to give back an infrastructure, in fact, actually to these places. And this infrastructure is, in fact, a very, very simple bazaar system that can integrate existing buildings and offer a portico to existing buildings, uh, but also shield the town from, obviously, the traffic of the, of the road. So it's a kind of very, very simple inhabitable wall for retail, but also, again, uh, for uh, uh, education. Uh, and it has a front that is very defined, but it has a back that is very open to informal integration with the city, uh, as it already happens. Again, so uh, in each of these groups, we will you will see there's a top-down project and there's a bottom-up project. Uh, in this case, actually, we're looking at Bucharest, uh, and Bucharest has a, a tradition of public spaces that I think is extremely interesting, uh, this typology that is called the Maidan. It is a very, very undefined uh, piece of land that is open for trade, uh, but also for production, uh, celebrations, all happening at the same time in an unscripted way. So actually, the author of this uh, project wanted to revive, actually, this tradition. This is the city as it is today. Uh, as you can see, it's marked by a series of rivers, but also by a series uh, of circular, uh, let's say, infrastructure interventions. So she was thinking where the river meets the circular uh, infrastructure, maybe we can have one of these Maidan structures. And uh, this is actually what you see here. She was imagining to restructure these streets along the rivers uh, and then eventually to offer this kind of unscripted public space that cannot really be called a square. It's in fact more of a garden. It's ringed with trees, uh, but you can see that it's actually very informal in the way in which actually it deals uh, with the tissue. But I think what is interesting about this space is that it marks a very important uh, uh, geographical point, no? where in the point where actually two main axes uh, meet. And potentially it can offer uh, to the people who live in this village uh, a way to concentrate services uh, around this space. But in a very, very, uh, let's say, uh, simple way, without building much, in fact, just by leaving an open air space uh, with ringed by si some trees, uh, that is going to somehow create an end point uh, to this linear system. So with the idea that here maybe the citizens can just come together into sacrificing this bit of space to create an open air space that is going to be used by everybody and whose architecture is ultimately only uh, greenery, pretty much. The third topic I think is the most controversial one of the lot because it it's ritual, and we all know that the European city in many cases actually has been shaped by ritual, both political and religious. Uh, this is obviously a contested topic in a situation like today, where obviously we have a lot of different uh, uh, ambitious uh, and both religious and political, uh, in a way, positions uh, that might not match always. Uh, but I do think that one thing we can take home from the issue of the ritual and the city, that is that the city is really a chronotope. So something that scripts space, uh, but also scripts time. So it's in fact actually a space that almost uh, has, in a way, an embedded uh, uh, script for a way to perform together, theatrically. I think the first project is maybe uh, the clearest one. Rome is a city where a lot of tourism, but also a lot of pilgrimage uh, activity actually takes place. But if you've been to Rome, you know that once you arrive in Rome, you arrive at the Termini Station, which is a pretty terrible infrastructural node. And you will see that here again, this role of infrastructure that I'm uh, quite interested in actually comes back again. How to stage, in a way, our right of, uh, to citizenship in and with and within the infrastructure and not outside of, it, of that. So the project actually sees uh, the intervention uh, uh, as a kind of huge wall that creates uh, a kind of theatrical space right in front of the Termini Station with the idea that when you are going to arrive to Rome, you are not going to be thrown out in the city, in the traffic, in the mess, but you are going to have actually a quite confrontational first arrival point in which you are going to find yourself pretty much in a void, uh, in a large void that is completely, in this case, actually devoid of any activity, any retail activity, um, and it's just basically pure space for potentially political rallies, uh, meetings, uh, uh, celebrations, and so on and so forth. And of course, the back of it is, on the contrary, very open to the city that is, as you all know, a very messy, uh, lively, and, and kind of colorful uh, space. In a way, learning from the project of, mm, that we saw before, this project, on the contrary, tries to make a ritual space out of the most uh, uh, mundane space that we can imagine, that is the parking lot. It's a project for Detroit. Uh, you will all know, actually, the uh, American grid uh, as, again, a kind of mm, very uh, pragmatic device uh, to subdivide space. But actually, what, the spa what this project tried to revive is the fact that at the, at the moment in which actually the grid arrived in the United States, it was not uh, at all a pragmatic uh, uh, device, but it was a device that was meant to recreate uh, a grid that kind of had a mirror in a heavenly order. In fact, most of these grids were actually copied 
from the grid of the Temple of Jerusalem, which is actually a quite ironic question. No? Actually, people looking for political freedom and religious freedom, they go to the United States, bringing the grid with them as a symbol, and then it gets translated pretty much into this, so into pure uh, property speculation device uh, uh, as we know it today. So the project actually uh, sought to uh, redesign actually a Jesuit university in the center, in, uh, in the outskirts of Detroit. Uh, you can see a very, very, repeti sorry, very repetitive situation uh, with the grid and so on and so forth. But the interesting thing of the project, I think, is the fact that this is the building. Uh, it's a nine square grid uh, uh, set of courtyards, uh, is that it had a massive uh, uh, parking lot in front of it uh, that was, in fact, uh, almost like a ritual uh, space in which actually the act of parking your car and then reaching the building and then eventually going to mass in the church in here was staged. So there was obviously a tongue in cheek aspect, uh, but I think that there was something for me also very powerful in this idea of rethinking the parking lot as the equivalent today of the same type of ritual space that would have we would have had in the Renaissance, for instance, uh, uh, with piazzas and pilgrimage routes. And I think that, I mean, of course, there is a, uh, there is a side to this project that also is quite ironic. Uh, but I do think that actually, for me, it was very interesting because it opened up possibilities uh, to find uh, a way of you know, staging uh, ambitions uh, even in the age of infrastructure. And then lastly, and for me most importantly, uh, in uncertainty. The streets at the end of the day cannot be too designed. It cannot be too scripted because it really has to remain a frame for public life that can change uh, from day to day, from decade to decade. It has to remain uh, somehow open to uncertainty um, while at the same time, of course, offering a frame for that. And I think the first project is a project that is very, uh, you know, close to what uh, with Pervitorio we're doing right now. Uh, it's actually a project in Seoul uh, that seeks to uh, redesign uh, this infrastructural ring in Seoul. So the idea is that there is a big infrastructural ring uh, with stations. It's a light, tra light train, basically, with stations. But the interesting thing is that these stations, uh, all located around the big central mountain in the, in the middle of the Seoul region, would not be buildings, but would be just open air spaces. So huge platforms uh, with no buildings. Uh. And you will ask yourself, of course, then what kind of agency do we have as architects if, if that's nothing, if that's just a surface? Well, as it comes out, actually quite a lot, because this platform, in fact, actually is uh, a platform that is already prepared uh, to plug in services. Uh, so it has electricity plugs, uh, water drainage, and so on and so forth. We are talking about a pretty huge space, uh, as you can uh, see in here. So in fact, the scripting of these services that can allow then pavilions, uh, that can allow temporary installations, uh, markets, uh, uh, parking obviously, and all these other activities uh, is actually very, very finely etched by the, by the author in this kind of almost like embroidery of services uh, purely on the surface. But I think what for me is amazing about this project is that this project can do a lot of commercial things, uh, but ultimately it can also become a place where a massive political demonstration can be staged which right now is a big problem because you know that Korea is undergoing uh, moments of uh, very difficult political moments of negotiation and uh, uh, finding a place where actually people can be represented uh, as, uh, as a m mass of people is actually very difficult but because the government discourages this for obvious reasons. So the project at the end is almost nothing. Uh, no, we have a moment in which actually we as architects almost like make a step back to let the citizens actually uh, take center stage. The project is literally this. It's basically just a frame for things uh, to happen. There is again, I think, also a kind of tongue-in-cheek uh, uh, you know, element to that because obviously it's a public project, but it's a project that is made to be hijacked. And then last uh, uh, project, uh, a project on a large infrastructural scale, uh, seeing how we can actually reappropriate landscape at a large scale as citizens. I think that this is also a very important uh, question. How do we actually reappropriate not only the small scale of our cities, but you know, the scale of the landscape in general? It's a project for Greece. It's a project that is actually 400 kilometers long all ac along the coast of Greece. That is a coast that is now threatened, of course, by speculation. But there is one thing to say. Still, the first few decades, uh, few, sorry, few uh, tens of meter meters from the coast uh, are still public domain. So that's an incredible gift, actually, that the Greek people have to defend, in fact, actually, this extremely thin strip of land all around. And maybe it has to be defended, creating some kind of public path that can be enjoyed, actually, by everybody creating ultimately a kind of theater out of this bay. So in a way, the figure of the theater is the figure of the whole amphitheater, but it's also going to be the figure of the project. Because the project is really literally nothing, it's just this. It's just a very, very simple path where you can go with a bike or something, uh, and whatever is going to be built attached to that can only be steps, can only be this kind of you know, theater. Again, very, very loosely scripted. Uh, it's another way actually to looking at how can we, in, in fact, uh, work with the void uh, much more than working, in fact, actually with built material. 
So this is, at the end of the day, uh, the project. So in a nutshell, actually, that's what we try to do with our students. Uh, it's trying to actually to come up with ideas uh, on how we can, as architects, but maybe also as citizens, uh, reclaim uh, some form of agency, and maybe also creativity, that is a political creativity, but perhaps also spatial uh, um, creativity as well. Thank you. Hello, everybody. <laughs> Much bigger than I expected. Um, but welcome, and lovely to see everyone. Um, so um, to the title that I was given, um, Architecture, Citizenship, um, Design Dialogue, um, uh, and Democracy, I've added a B and a D. Um, one is bravery, and the other is diversity. And um, I like the word palimpsest, um, which my dictionary tells me is a manuscript or a piece of writing material on which later writing has been superimposed or effaced. Um, and, um, and then a second um, meaning is something reused or altered, but still bearing visible traces of its earlier form. Um, so this talk is about civil rights and it's about diversity and memory of place and how events can create positive palimpsests um, of architecture in the urban realm. So um, just taking this amazing image of um, the I what's become known as the I Have a Dream um, talk, Martin Luther King in 1963, and the image of Abraham Lincoln looking over um, the sea of people who, from all sorts of backgrounds who turned up on that day. <coughs> and the quote from the dream speech, the architects of our republic wrote the magnificent words of the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence, a promissory note to which every American was to fall heir. And I think that for many people in the world, this is such an inspiration. Um, and um, I think in terms of think thinking about the palimpsest, I thought, well, there's the land, and then there's the landscape, and then there's the architecture. Um, but then you add the people, and then you add the sound. So for me, it's very difficult to look at this image without hearing the words of the speech and the intonations and the cadences and the music of Martin Luther King, who at that age, I think, was 33 or 34 when he made that speech. Um, and so looking just at the snapshot, um, those cadences and the music, the rhythms of that speech of his background as a preacher and a promise that all men, yes, black men as well as white men, and of course women weren't included in this speech. Um, <laughs> so that's, that's another additional, additional layer that we add to that palimpsest of our, of our own, of our um, growth as people and understanding of civil rights that um, no doubt he would have wanted to add women and um, diverse people and everything that we think of would be guaranteed the unalienable rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And that those words are said in such an, an ordinary and expectant way and in such an inspiring way that it's very hard to, for me at any rate to look at that image without hearing the speech, which I've listened to any number of times, thanks to YouTube. Um, and then um, Obama, another layer um, of hope and aspiration um, that um, the man that I tend to call the pharaoh um, would be a black man and, in, and come to power in such an unexpected, unexpected way. And again, the landscape, the architecture, the people, the sound, the water, 
the trees in the sky. Um, and here a um, picture of Obama, and no doubt Amer the American people in the room will co correct me, um, but um, my research tells me that this bell, which is I think known as the Liberty Bell, was made in Whitechapel in 1752, which is um, an unexpected connection for those of us who um, hang out with hipsters and know about um, how things have changed in London over the last few years. Um, and standing next to it is the son of Martin Luther King. Um, so if I just, um, it, the guy next between the, the two women um, and Martin Luther, on the right, Martin Luther King's granddaughter, uh, a five-year-old. Um, and this statement here, again of hope and aspiration and expectation. So the architecture and the landscape um, coalesces in the people um, who use the space and who are inspired by the history of the space. Um, and then change comes, again in an unexpected way. And um, I had a, an interesting conversation with a taxi driver, a black taxi driver, on the way here, and said, have you seen, have you seen that, um, um, that petition? Um, and he said, yeah, it's a load of bollocks, isn't it? Um, and, I was <laughs> the, and the petition is to prevent Obama from coming to the UK. Um, Oh, sorry, Trump, sorry, <laughs> Trump. Mustn't get them mixed up. Yes, so um, it's Trump going to the UK. And, um, and of course, my ex expectation was that, you know, there would be a, a level of agreement. And so we had this conversation about Trump being, isn't he great? He, and, you know, um, this is a man who, he said, this is a man who does what he says. He will do what he says. Um, and, you know, no doubt he'll be given another four years. So I was quite surprised. So <laughs> this, this is an unexpected layer to my <laughs> understanding of what's going on in the world at the moment. But this space um, and, and this the, the, the public realm has become a, 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 a meeting point for a coalition of an unexpected coalition and layers upon layers upon layers of political activity all taking place across the world. Um, in the public realm. The other thing, um, and the other sound, um, which I don't advise you to do, but I'll tell you about it anyway. A friend of mine was singing Nelly the Elephant um, in relation to Donald Trump. And those of you who know, know the del Nelly the Elephant, there was, there's a line that goes, oh, she went with a trumpety trump, 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 trump. And this song has just been going through my head <laughs> practically since the uh, inauguration, and it's very, very annoying, but <laughs> um, it, that this is another aspect of the, the idea of palimpsest, of the layering of not just of land and people and sites and architecture, but also of um, words and music, sometimes unwanted. Um, so just going back to some of the work that I've done, I, I was lucky enough to work on the UK Supreme Court, which for a long time I considered to be my own building, because I would turn up and people would say, oh, hi, Elsie, come in. And I would walk around and I'd tell people what to do, and it was great. And then one day I turned up and somebody, and walked up to the front door and somebody said, yes, can I help you? Um, and I suddenly realised that it wasn't my building. <laughs> it wasn't my building anymore. And there is that sense of um, ownership of a building and entitlement and empowerment when you're doing a building that suddenly comes to a stop, um, usually around the date of handover. Um, and, and then you find yourself standing on the pavement looking wistfully through the windows and wishing you'd done all sorts of things differently. But now I'm a member of the UK Supreme Court Arts Trust, so I get to go in and I get to um, picture at the bottom, um, hang out with um, the justices the justices of the Supreme Court, and um, who are the most erudite and clever and wonderful people in the entire world, and no doubt they would tell you that themselves if they were here. Um, <laughs> so, um, and then, um, so now I can sort of regain some of my connection with the building, um, but suddenly it's become 
a space of contention and of um, public discourse, which is absolutely wonderful, but completely unexpected. Um, and again, um, designing um, transport projects, which change every day. Um, so the site and the people, and in, in, in terms of Supreme Court, uh, in terms of um, Green Park, thousands and thousands and thousands of people changing the building, the buildings every day. Um, and again, with transport design in Accra and Lagos, the potential of 23,000 people um, per hour in Lagos using a system um, that um, we designed. And um, I mentioned Stephan Stephanie Edwards here, which is who was um, instrumental in um, putting these projects together. Um, and architecture is something which is always, always more than um, half a dozen, 20, 30 people. Um, similarly, with um, the City Hall at the moment, which we're, we're working on in Kumasi in Ghana, which is uh, probably the largest civic building in that part of um, the, the sub-region. Um, so just to finish, we're, so we're working on um, the um, James Fort Accra, which is a 17th, 17th, 18th century building, which has gone from being a staging post to being um, a, a trading post to being a slave factory where slaves um, from the interior of Ghana um, were marched down through the country and held in this building um, until they were deported to America, to the Americas. Um, and a place really of great sorrow and great pain, which then became the local prison, actually the national prison, where um, Kwame Nkrumah and the so-called Big Six, the founding fathers of the Republic of Ghana, were held in, the, in isolation under the British colonial government and were, um, were released to um, huge crowds in Jamestown, which is where we're working. Um, and then, strangely enough, um, 10 years later, this very same man is dancing with Her Majesty the Queen. So things change. And um, at independence, um, somebody who would have recognized the Lincoln Memorial, Richard Nixon, in Ghana representing the US. Um, so for me, the interesting question is how this scene, which is um, a cry in 1923, and this, you may not be able to see it, but this is the square where this huge um, independence rally was held after the big six were released from James Fort, which, oops, which is <laughs> this building here. Um, this building here. Um, how, how we can now, as our instructions as architects, um, turn it into a, um, a training centre for, for local young people um, and workshops where people are going to be learning skills in um, computer-aided design, jewellery. And the question re for me really is whether um, the series of Talon Fest, which, as I say, entails sorrow and pain and um, political action, um, can be used by this wonderful artist, has been used by this wonderful artist, Serge Cloche, who we, um, uh, we um, had as an artist in residence just after he qualified. So from, from here, from the 18th century to the 21st century, and all these layers in between um, is, for me, a really fascinating challenge as an architect um, and um, moving from slavery through civil rights to the 21st century and how we take it from there. That was that was fantastic. I'm, I'm, I um, hope I'm not going to disappoint as a final speaker. <laughs> um, so I'm just going to find my presentation. Um, okay. 
Um, so, uh, yeah, my, my name's Asif Khan. I have a, a practice here in, in London. Um, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to present, um, I guess, sort of the beginnings of my architecture, I think, and sort of um, with this first project uh, in Brazil. And I'm going to sort of end up with something we've done quite recently. And, uh, and I guess this is an interesting opportunity tonight to look at the threads that can, can kind of uh, connect them, uh, particularly with this topic of, of citizenship. And, um, and it's a topic which, which somehow has particular um, resonance this week. Um, so I think all of us, we're all sort of checking our passports to see that we've got the right stamps. <laughs> uh, so um, yeah, I'll, I'll begin with this, this project. Um, so this is a project I did at the AA with two other um, students um, there, and it was a uh, we were invited as a as a group under Michael Hensel as a tutor there to look at um, public space in Recife, which is an equatorial town, and we kind of got to have it went there with a whole lot of gadgets and gizmos to sort of measure wind speed and temperature variations and light and occupancy and so on, and we made the really basic discovery, which which might seem very obvious now, but wasn't obvious to us as 25-year-old students, that, that um, public space in an equatorial town needs shading. Um, so, uh, and actually, once you create shade, uh, lots of things happen there, and habitation happens there. And this, is a, this um, favela was uh, a place where, um, which sort of had, had grown between a flour mill uh, and, um, and some car parks, and it was the only space sort of left in the city, and this, this housing sort of merged there. Um, and through a kind of process of uh, beginning research and conversation with, with neighbourhood, um, the neighbourhoods of businesses there, so small um, uh, guys vending all sorts of things from fruit to, to, to uh, lottery tickets, we, uh, we proposed to make a small uh, shading canopy. Um, and uh, this was literally a $50 project done in a, in a day. But the, the, the canopy was a, uh, the idea of a kind of a, a public engagement or a direct uh, architect to sort of user um, um, process a negotiation which could result in, in something um, and then be tested rather than through measurement, um, statistical measurement of, uh, uh, of some idea, we test it through, through practical intervention. <coughs> so this is uh, our little group, which was a mixture of Brazilian students and, and uh, students from London. Um, and this was this was the kind of result at the, at the end of the, af the end of the afternoon. And so once we, what was very interesting about the project is, once we had created it, um, a man turned up selling CDs. Uh, kids started playing here after school, um, and it was it was something that only lasted there for a few months. But um, uh, the yellowness of it, which was kind of this, uh, uh, gave the place a kind of landmark. It gave it a presence uh, from the distance. Uh, which meant that you were able to see the favela. So in a way, it didn't have a. It became a place as opposed to kind of a, um, a chance occurrence um, in of density change or something. So, um, and actually, you could see this from about a mile away. So uh, the kind of opportunity here was kind of giving, um, marking the place, uh, and um, and engaging, in a way which these people hadn't been engaged with. And kind of this thing is the outcome of their multiple voices. Um, not the whole voice of the, not, not the consensus of the entire favela, but the particular ones on this street. Um, and then sort of coming sort of 10 years uh, after this in, in, in London, this is a project uh, which uh, I did last year at the uh, London Design Festival in, in Old Street. And what you're seeing here is a kind of corridor which we've implanted in, uh, uh, in Old Street, just in front of Vince Court, which is a... a, a, a Pretty busy, um, pretty busy area. A re mixture of kind of confluence of residential, uh, which has been there for a really long time, uh, commercial activity, the tech startups, and all of that that's going on all around Old Street. Um, you know, two billion, uh, I think two billion pounds of venture capital was was kind of invested in this area last year, um, uh, and it's quite a deprived area. So it's quite strange. You see, you see marked differences between populations there, and then of course Friday night, Saturday night, it's where um, people are marauding through going to going to bars, and I, I've been one of those people occasionally. Although I am a Hackney resident, so I somehow feel this is my my backyard in some way. Um, but there's never any place where those people can meet. So this project, which was commissioned uh, 
uh, unusually by the company Mini, uh, was, uh, which is a car company, was to look at what, what kind of spaces uh, could a city provide or could like a, a, a private company provide for public use in the city, uh, which could exploit space which hadn't been exploited before. Um, and they used this idea of third place, which is a kind of um, uh, concept of a coffee shop or uh, you know, some, a place that takes activity that we can't do it at home, we don't do it at the office, but it kind of fulfills a, the opportunity for, for other things to happen. Um, and uh, what we created was, was a sort of series of green spaces. Um, and they're sort of alo along different themes. There were three of these made. One was, one was for kind of chance encounters. So this one had a bench inside it where people who are walking in the street uh, can meet their neighbors, essentially, uh, from whichever kind of stream of life they're coming from. Um, one was uh, for relaxation. And the third one was uh, a kind of workspace. And uh, where, where, in a way, the opportunity for, for collaboration with, with, with um, people who are working in that area uh, might appear. Uh, and all sp spaces were bookable. So the idea being that you could, uh, public space uh, could be used, uh, could have a time index kind of attached to it, which I think, uh, I think Maria mentioned as well. It's a very interesting thing to think of kind of quantizing the street uh, in time. Um, and, and then there's a second layer of it, which is I think something which um, the, the, f the first project in Brazil hadn't tackled really, which was a kind of custodian of the space. So when you give, a, when you give public space to multiple owners, um, either everyone is responsible and organized to be responsible enough, and the architect somehow is a conduit towards that, um, or no one cares and no one's responsible, and eventually the thing decays into, into, uh, or, uh, and doesn't get maintained. So here, um, I remembered from my youth sort of a, um, the figure of the librarian in my life. So the kind of public, uh, the most important kind of public space as I was growing up was our local library um, for me, and I spent a lot of time there. Instead, I didn't have a childminder that was sort of put, dumped in the library. <laughs> until 6 p.m. most evenings. So um, here, instead of a librarian, we had a horticulturalist who was, who, whose job wa it was to be the kind of um, uh, the caretaker of the spaces and the person who instigates conversations between individuals. And the conversations were about plants and plant care. Um, and at the, end of, uh, at the end of the event or during the event, people could bring their plants to be maintained and taken away. At the, uh, so it's a kind of library for plants. Um, and yes, these chance encounters happen. People, met, I used to hang out here <laughs> during that time because the people you'd meet were fascinating uh, cross section. And people would also pass through almost unaware that these things were happening. They became adopted into the kind of natural um, uh, streetscape. Uh, and then, because we all like queuing, um, queues also <laughs> formed because <laughs> this idea of a new form of interaction between your, you and your neighbors became something actually that was worth experiencing. So it was different. But I mean, the idea is essentially is a prototype which could, uh, could appear anywhere, why not? Um, and so this is a picture from my Instagram feed actually, which is one of the, uh, one of the local residents whose uh, plant, this plant life um, then became part of her home. So the idea of extending something public into a private space. So this is another example, someone, someone writing about the plant they took home from that space. Um, so actually it's interesting to trust the public with, uh, um, to trust individuals uh, with things which are common property in a way. So the idea, this is a forest, but people can take it home, keep it for a while, and bring it back uh, to the city when they're, when they're done with it. Um, a d quite different scale. This is a project uh, which also deals with kind of public presence in private presence in public space. Uh, this is a project in Sochi for the Winter Olympics. So it's already a kind of a, an unusual and quite well-known kind of complex s political story there about inclusion. And I was asked by a telecom company to, to make a project for them. Um, and the project um, uh, was one which I wanted to, um, it's called Mega Faces. I wanted to kind of um, play with the idea of um, uh, it's iconography, essentially, the kind of the everyman uh, and the individual. And the Olympic Games are a place where the hero is venerated. But what if we could turn it on its head and make every person into a hero for, for a moment? And this sort of plays with the idea of um, uh, the, the, the prominence of the face as a kind of tool of, of, uh, um, of communicating emotion, but through you know, Statue of Liberty on one hand, um, to Facebook, FaceTime, selfie, all of that. The sharing of the face, emoticons, is, um, is something we continue to do. So I thought, why not make a, a, a Mount Rushmore 
uh, or, a, or a, um, you know, Vera Makuna's uh, um, uh, uh, Mother Russia, but for, for today. So you kind of turn the everyman in back into the individual um, and you celebrate the individual but in within public space. So this is a, um, you would be 3D scanned and every five uh, or 10 minutes, uh, you after five or 10 minutes, your, your face would appear on the front of the building in three dimensions. So. Um, uh, for 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 a um, for a child or a, or an adult, they had the chance to kind of become to face the Olympic Games. So it's a, it's a, it was a chance to kind of invert the traditional uh, uh, expectations of public space, particularly in Russia. Um, and it was a completely, in, in, I guess, a, it wasn't a protest, but it was a kind of um, acknowledgement of inclusivity um, there. Okay. Uh, and then sort of another scale, uh, and uh, there we acted as, as architects with a large corporation uh, who, who, have, um, uh, who deal with public content, let's say, but within, within a public space. And here we acted as, as kind of uh, almost uh, user to user. We were, we, as architects in my, my kids' school, we designed their, their, um, their playground. So rather than taking the role as architect, sorry, it, I was taking the role as a parent. And the, the role of the parent there, well myself, was to facilitate a discussion of what a playground could be. And, uh, and um, uh, through a series of workshops, um, we set out homework for the kids. You know, what, 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 what could your playground be, essentially? So you get these really, uh, really beautiful drawings from some of them. Um, I think we sent out two or 300 of these to all the kids. And you get this, this range from quite specific requirements some which we couldn't satisfy, like swing pools uh, and slides and uh, to from the roof, um, bungee jump, don't know where they came from, uh, to really abstract things um, like this, <laughs> which, <are laughs> so, um, which we tried to take all, the, all these thoughts in, in, in mind. But, but I think what was, what was interesting about this process was um, this project was about setting up a process, not about designing a piece of architecture. And I think that's the same for the first project I show you as well, where you create something and, and then serendipity allows things to happen because you've, you've put the librarian in place or the, the plant person, horticulturist in place, and you've put this environment in place there around them. So this is, a, this, this is a kind of end result. There is a hill, there is a slide, there is a corridor, there are nets. Uh, it's open and closed at the same time. Uh, it's, it's safe, but also risky. Um, and, and kids can do whatever they want here. So it's really just a space where things can happen rather than, it's trying to be non-architecture and it's lifted off the ground uh, so that the firemen can pass through if the, underneath it if the building sets on fire, the, 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 the main school. Uh, so kids kind of find their own way of using it. It's got quiet space and loud space as well. Um, and then um, final, final thing I want to show you, or final two things I want to show you. This is the Museum of London. This is the, uh, it will be the Museum of London in 2022. Uh, Smithfield's Market, which I'm sure you all know, in, down here in Farringdon, uh, is up there, the meat market. This is the poultry market. This is the uh, general market, which has been um, derelict for a number of years, and the fish market down here. And this is the uh, Museum of London wants to move from the Barbican to a new site here. And um, I, I don't want to show you the whole scheme. Uh, There's a competition that we won with Stanton Williams uh, um, earlier this year, but I, uh, last at the end of last year. But I want to show you one small fragment of it which relates to to this um, to this topic, which which is which is in here, which is in the general market. Um, so uh, this, if you imagine, not at scale. This is a diagram of the general market somehow here, and it's at this kind of center point of uh, historical things. You know, incredible um, LSE uh, courts of justice you have here, uh, um, and uh, you know the Charter House, 1370s. But at the same time, the f the overlaying of this. Uh, the seat of power, culture, creativity, the startups up there, history and finance. So you've got the kind of um, uh, all the ideas that are being generated in London at the moment um, surrounding this museum. Um, and the museum has a very strong idea of wanting to change, change itself from just a, something as a, uh, as a receptacle of objects, I mean, it has a lot, it has seven million objects, to something which can send, can absorb all of this, these thoughts and digest them and send them back out into the city. So like to become a kind of conduit for, um, for future thought in the city. So it's a creative thing rather than just a, a storage box. Um, so, um, and the idea, that the idea in the museum that I is, is kind of strongest to my heart and uh, from our proposals is this idea that the museum is, 
is in, is in that building, it's underground, but, uh, but at ground level we have something called the public house. And this is playing with this idea of the public houses were the, the meeting rooms of the city and it's where ideas, okay, a lot of drinking was done there, but also ideas and some of the greatest ideas in London were generated there. Um, the public house, and around the public house is a mixture of retail and a kind of incubator. And I'm going to just zoom into what that incubator looks like. Um, this idea that within a museum you could have um, LSE cities, Adam will be there, you'll have a desk, <laughs> um, and you could have the Royal, of Art, Royal College of Art, you could have Rough Trade Records, but you could have also Google DeepMind next to uh, the oldest umbrella manufacturer in London. You could have Save, Save Victorian Architecture, next to the NLA. So you get people who want to save things and people who want to kind of develop them, architecture and cities, next to each other. There's a kind of friction between all the participants in this incubator, which means new ideas get created. Imagine uh, someone who's studying Victorian shoes um, uh, uh, sitting next to someone, co-working with someone who's designing the future of footwear. So the idea of, um, of um, public space being adjacent to this kind of institution of, 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 of brains, which are all talking and corresponding, is something uh, I think quite new and quite interesting way for a, for a museum to function. I think that's, um, uh, that was my last slide, really. Yeah, I just, I'm particularly interested in this idea of uh, how, as architects, we can kind of give, we can create uh, uh, um, spaces for that sort of interaction to happen. And then we can let go and let the city sort of happen in front of us rather than kind of being, rather than controlling it through the buildings we make. Thank you. Thank you all very much. I'm just going to ask one question that I'm going to open up to the, to the floor because there's quite a few of you here who I'm sure have a lot of things to say. Um, but what I noticed as a sort of a common thread through, through all of those conversations was an empowering of citizens to take control of their space. Um, and I think you, know, you each did it in your own way. Um, and I'm wondering whether there is some kind of, um, as Asif mentioned, this process of, of um, architects actually giving back and sort of Maria, you talked about sort of non-design, you know, sort of actually saying, no, actually, let's give this to the citizens to see what they want. Um, and Adam, you talked about sort of different scales of this. How do you, how do you sort of scale up the ability for, for people to, to take control? And perhaps I was thinking also, um, you know, you talked a bit sort of about interventions and then just scaling up that particular intervention. But I thought about infiltration, you know, how do you actually get sort of within other schemes. Um, and Elsie, you're, you're talking about sort of civil liberties and how um, different buildings can grow over a lifetime of the building. And sort of how do we reuse spaces and think about sort of the history and the heritage behind it. So I think, you know, with that in mind, I'm just wondering, through, through the course of having heard each other's talks, if there's anything that you, you could speak to about sort of you know, what are the next steps for this? So what, what are the next steps for taking this process further and maybe, you know, creating some kind of tools for other architects to be able to start to implement some of these ideas into their practice? Do you want to start? <laughs> Asif, go ahead. I guess I'm warmed up yeah. already. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think that the, the thing that, the thing that I, I'd like to um, encourage is engagement with all the people who are making our public spaces and our private spaces, uh, the companies, whatever sort of company they are, you know, mm -hmm. whether they're a telecoms company, whether they're a Coca-Cola, whether even a McDonald's, whatever, the Westfields, all of these people, they are actually, um, and the developers and, uh, you know, manufacturers, then they are actually, they're often in far more powerful positions to, um, to um, to create the world around us, but very few are, or not enough architects want to um, who have good let's say who have um, concerns about say erosion of public space or concerns about kind of agency of the individual. Not enough of those architects are um, jumping uh, jumping up, you know, are, are approaching these people and saying, "Hey, I want to work with you. How can we make? What can we do that makes you happy, but also makes?" 
uh, um, community happen or makes um, um, uh, gives people a kind of uh, a s better public space or something. So I, I think you're talking about architect architect initiating projects as opposed to um, a client coming to an architect. No, no. I, I, I sorry, I'm not being very clear. I'm, I'm um, you know, there are there are a lot of people, um, a lot of architects, friends of mine even, who say, oh, we only do public projects. And there's a sort of snobbery about uh, about the way that they, the kind of client that they engage with, and there is a sense also within the architectural community uh, and the urban planning community that you know of of kind of good ones, good guys who are on the good side and guys who are on the bad side. Um, and I think uh, in order for um, we we have to kind of recognise that there are so many uh, different people building our cities uh, today, yeah. particularly today, there's, and. and and in order to get the best city out of it, the good guys have to work with the bad guys, mm -hmm. and the bad guys have to work with the good guys, and we have to, we have to help each other, right? Because mm -hmm. people have a lot of other, um, for some people, money is the bottom line, and and for others, the kind of result and the kind of level of engagement is the bottom line. And I think, so we have to sort of teach each other. And what was interesting through this project, so we found that, um, uh, I don't know if we have worked with institutions, public, and uh, cultural organizations, and um, and I've worked with Coca-Cola and all that. Yeah. And just what was quite interesting about it is um, they're all very interested in this topic, and they all want to find ways that can kind of improve uh, uh, the world around us. Um, some of them want their bottom line fixed as well. Sure. Um, but that's the, s the same can be said for, for, for the state and for um, for the mayor's office, right? They sort of do tick boxes. So. Um, I just want to kind of throw that up as something that's a bugbear for me. That I, 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 um, uh, I think we need to engage more. No, I would completely agree, and I have to say, I mean, thank you so much for the presentation because it's actually really uh, very, um, in a way, uh, it gives me a lot of hope to see that a lot of the things that we try to experiment with students, you are doing uh, in, in the real world. And actually, this question of engagement, uh, I think that there are two things that you said for me that are super important. And one thing is this last thing about engagement. Because I, I totally believe that actually even the good uh, city spaces, urban spaces from the past have never been born out of solely good intentions. Mm -hmm. There was always a negotiation, there was always a conflict. In some cases, the process of making those public spaces uh, was even more interesting than the architectural result. There was always uh, some kind of fight between the community and powerful people or not so powerful people, different contingencies. So I think that uh, you are totally right, and I think that that is actually what makes uh, a public space interesting, is the, is the process, is the negotiation with which we get to a project uh, that is never going to be complete and it's never going to be perfect, but it, it has to raise questions, it has to raise issues, uh, and, and I think I completely agree. The other question that I think you mentioned earlier that I found very, very important, uh, and in a way it's something that we as architects are not yet able to deal with uh, yet well, is the, that question of custodianship. Uh, Mm -hmm. So, like, taking ownership uh, of that space uh, between, well, yeah, what we what I call the space between buildings, I mean, not to call it public space because I think that that's already, like, a loaded, uh, loaded term. And I think that that is a big question, and I think you're mm -hmm. totally right. One of the few things that we can do, maybe as still as architects, uh, is still to create some kind of framework uh, to, to, trigger, to trigger that dynamic, mm -hmm. uh, even more than designing. That's the thing that we can design at the end. We can only really design ways of bringing people together, so ways of being bringing also different ambitions together. And if there is a clash or if there is a conflict, so be it. I think that mm -hmm. that is exactly the point <coughs> of doing projects like the ones that you showed us. And I think, you know, your, your uh, initial student project with the, with the yellow um, curtain, I think it's, it's really crystal clear, it's all in there, you know, bringing in different actors, what you want as architects from outside, what they want f as locals. Uh, uh, and, and of course, that's the kind of conversation that we want to be having, even more than the, than the physical form. But then, of course, the physical form enables that. So I think that that's where maybe we as architects, exactly as you were saying, have to be a little bit more creative or a little bit more uh, projective, let's say, uh, hopefully. Kelsey or Adam, do you want to comment on this? Go ahead. Okay. Um, well, I was, uh, as you were talking, I was thinking that one of my problems with public spaces is, is beating people back with a big stick. Because as soon as the space is finished, you know, it sort of gets, it gets um, um, used almost like um, people just um, encapsulate it, if you like, in a really unexpected way. With the Supreme Court, you know, we set up these lovely pristine benches with poetry written all over it. And 
by the weekend, the local skateboarders had discovered it, and there were big chunks of big chunks of stone missing. Mm -hmm. um, so we then had to come along and put, you know, those metal things um, to stop people using that public space in the way that it wasn't intended to be used. And you know, that that um, small public space in Little George Street is suddenly filled with, you know, hundreds of police in high vis jackets. And who would have thought? you know, when you were designing it, that that's what was going to happen. I mean, it's perfectly all right, but it's sort of, it's a bit disturbing when you've got this sort of pristine image and, the, you know, Marley von Sternberg's lovely photograph in your head, you know, and you <laughs> turn up, and it's become a completely different space. So, and, and there's a sort of sense of empowerment in, and entitlement that people feel about public spaces, mm -hmm. particularly big ones, which I think is really great. And that photograph of the Lincoln Memorial, you know, hundreds, millions of people just turn up because they feel it's their space and they're entitled to be there. And I, I think that's just fantastic. I guess, I, I mean, the only thing I would perhaps add and, and maybe perhaps disagree a little with you, Astrid, um, on your call for, for kind of a super affirmative collaboration, but not to stand back from that, because that's playing devil's advocate, is is where might the space be <coughs> because there are such vast different structures of power mm. at play. Yeah, that's a problem. So it's not to say that just good and bad, those aren't quite the qualifiers that articulate um, a Coca-Cola versus a local council. Um, and, and so I think there is something very interesting at play in, in, in making that a, a kind of assumption or assertion. Nor is there the capacity of people outside of, let's say, a stock market to intervene in a company or their consumer power. Mm -hmm. Whereas at a local council, mm -hmm. there are multiple trajectories and mechanisms for transparency. So I think some of those things are, are important to hold um, when we might think about your initial question mm -hmm. about where citizens can kind of have empowerment. Mm -hmm. um, not to detract fully from, I think, mm -hmm. um, uh, on the other side, a kind of black and white no and yes. Um, and just on that point, I'm minded of a early conversation in Teat Mundi in New York with two um, kind of Palestinian uh, architect activists, Alexandro Petty and, and, and Sandy Hillal, who were working on Campus for Camps and kind of helped to <laughs> disentangle the good, bad from public-private. Mm. Because yes. we actually said, well, the public in a lot of spaces around the world might not be um, as open, generous, or transparent mm. as you might assume mm. in other parts of the space. So that mm. it can kind of flip on its head in different spaces. And so we might need different kinds of languages to think mm -hmm. um, across the different very, different. very, mm -hmm. very modes of, of, of kind of either uh, developing and or appropriating mm -hmm. um, one's access to public and private space to think beyond maybe that, that dialogue or that dialectic. But about that, actually, you mentioned earlier something that I also found very interesting about this idea of commoning uh, or the mm -hmm. common in general. And I think that this is also something that is coming back in discussions uh, with architects, but also activists uh, more and mm -hmm. more. So actually, what do we really mean by public? Do we mean something that is owned uh, and managed by the state, which, as we all know, is not necessarily positive uh, mm -hmm. uh, for many reasons? Uh, uh, or do we mean something that is publicly accessible? And I think actually the, the potential of this idea of the common, that is something that really blurs uh, mm -hmm. the distinction between what is public and what is private, uh, and that is made uh, uh, fundamentally out, out of this whatever kind of agreement of people in, in the use, in fact, of space more than the ownership of space. Uh, that I find actually really interesting because we know that in many cases actually some of the most interesting places for demonstration, for instance, have not necessarily been public domain because of course you can be in fact actually be uh, thrown out of public spaces very easily while it's not so easy to occupy private spaces. Uh, so I think, I think you are totally right. I mean, actually the, maybe the, the problem of reframing the relationship between also public and private uh, is uh, uh, could be a way out of that. So that's also why I'm, I'm a bit skeptical towards you know the use of the, of the term public space uh, mm. because it you know it first has to be somehow defined and maybe redefined uh, potentially. Mm. Great guys, well I I'd like to open up the floor now. Um, would someone like to ask the first question? Yes, please. Um, this is building on <coughs> what Astrid said about uh, engaging with companies. Um, Am I right in saying that the primary school project, you received the donation of materials? Yes. Um, can you yeah. have a little bit about how you funded that sure. in a practical way? Are you from that company? <laughs> 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 OK, I'll mention it. <laughs> 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 uh, yeah, that was. Uh, Sorry, did everyone hear that question? So can you repeat that again? Shall I repeat? Or, you, or maybe ask if you want to repeat that. Uh, no, yeah, she asked uh, um, about uh, 
engagement with companies and whether, uh, and to have more information about the Truth and Health Primary School project and, and, and the kind of donation materials that you had. So once we'd established a, a, some, some kind of broader parameters for the design, um, and the <coughs> first thing that got designed actually was tremendously expensive, and the school had a budget um, to, the budget didn't include paying, a, paying an architect, <laughs> <laughs> so that, that, that was okay, you know. Um, but as a parent, I wanted to, 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 to lend my services to lots of other parents that were doing the same. Uh, one was one created a huge dinner, he's a chef, to raise money for the playground, and someone else made a film. And, you know, sort of um, so we found ourselves quite short m money wise, and I kind of I looked at uh, which companies had previously sponsored um, stuff for London Design Festival. This wasn't a festival project, and it was this, this um, American Hardwood Association. Mm -hmm. Had done a lot of things at the VNA and wor working with architects, and were, were kind of interested in challenges, mm -hmm. but they'd never done a permanent project before as mm -hmm. part of their sponsorship process. Uh, you know, they, it's quite interesting. A lot of sponsors don't want the long term, uh, don't want the long term engagement normally because it means because if they're the kind of um, if the if they're kind of uh, I forget the marketing term, but it's basically they're they're, they're, they're marketing. Um, requ requirements change over the years. They don't want to have the association with mm. that project they did five oh. years ago, which is now permanent. They want to—they're always moving with things. But um, because there was a custodian, which is a school, who would take over the thing permanently, they were willing to to, to work on it, and um, and they donated uh, something like thirty thousand pounds worth of between thirty and fifty thousand pounds worth of timber, which the school would otherwise have to have paid, and. And because we created a kind of structure for them to plug in that was uh, harmless, mm. but mm -hmm. got the value that they needed, which was a photograph and uh, a film about making, they were very pleased to, uh, to engage with us, engage with the school. And actually, they added so much more. They, was like they got the kids to um, they have they propose some workshops where kids can learn about kind of timber and ha how it ages and mm -hmm. all the impacts of wood. And they want to go into planting with them and all this stuff. Um, so I think interesting things come, can come out of it, and I think, um, I mean, we're, we, uh, I've kind of extended that model to lots of other projects, trying to find ways of partnering, which, uh, where there's a sort of win-win. Uh, there's not, there isn't always. I mean, it sometimes gets quite complex, and uh, um, you have to give across, give away too much of the project, so it doesn't become worth mm -hmm. it in a, in, in a way. Um, but yeah, we're sort of. Uh, we become sort of middlemen yeah. who mm -hmm. create, make the project happen, and then you know, let those organisations find their own way of their own relationships. The aspect of democracy versus expertise, um, and as if you sort of engage in kind of architectural direct democracy in asking your end users, the, the kids, to literally draw what they wanted. Uh, and then sort of reinterpreted that yourself. Um, question to the whole panel, how do you think that sort of populist approach almost to architecture translates into a, an adult environment? Effectively, how does that apply in the rest of the architectural sphere? Uh, and what does a, a populist architecture, if you will, look like? <coughs> Maybe I'll add before, because I'm not an architect, and so I think <laughs> hearing from the others who have actually probably engaged in kind of public consultation in, in, in that kind of direct way would be much more interesting. But I will just say one, one moment from our designing politics exercise and a lot of the submissions. I think um, some of them actually articulated rather than placing the democratic ethos at an inclusion of citizens in the design process, they thought more about maybe a democratic ethos in uh, the ownership or the management of what was to be designed. Mm -hmm. And so trying to see if, if there is something we want to enable in the relation of design or democracy, where is that best placed? And, and where does it have the, have the most kind of possibility to maybe then uh, have, have a longevity? So that, that would be something we learned from the, from the process. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's, that that's probably what I took from the Chisholm Hill project as well, mm -hmm. that the, the, the children, um, the, the, the actually, the, the point of engagement, okay, of course we were canvassing for kind of what, um, we're learning about their existing playground through that process, what things they like, what was missing. 
um, and what ingredients they would be. But it was more about gaining their feeling of ownership over what was to come. Mm -hmm. Or at least that's what ter it turned out to be. Mm -hmm. And then they were the ones who communicated. And what was funny is once you built it, they were all telling each other, this was my idea, <laughs> which, is which is kind of what you want, right? <laughs> uh, yeah, it's fantastic. So, and then it got them all interested in, in architecture and model making, and all because we, we sort of built some stuff with them, and the school did a project about model making as well. Um, so this was more important. This was, uh, uh, yeah, than commit designing with a kind of compromise kind of committee approach, of, you know, where everything, everyone is literally the designer, which I think yeah, mm -hmm. doesn't always result in the best thing. Yeah, well, I have, a, I have a quite a strange story about consultation, one of, one of the strange stories about consultation, which is when we're doing the Supreme Court, um, our clients, um, known as the senior users, were the law lords who sat in the House of Lords, and they were very happy and cosy in the House of Lords, and they had no intention of moving anywhere else. So our job was to try and persuade them that the, su the Supreme Court, which was um, the Middlesex Crown Court, which lots of them had used when they were baby barristers and absolutely hated the building and did not want to go anywhere near it, was going to be their new home. Um, so we had to, s we, we, were, we were tasked with the job of persuading them that this horrible building was going to be lovely. Um, and so um, we set up a, a design committee chaired by Baroness Hale, who's now the um, Vice President of the Supreme Court. And we had to make all these lovely drawings and get all these artists involved and um, take them to see artist studios and show them lots of lovely work. And they were only just convinced. Um, and in fact, there was a debate in the House of Lords where they said that um, if Norman Foster wasn't going to be the architect, um, then they weren't interested. <laughs> they weren't <laughs> interested. And, and it was us as the architects. So <laughs> there was, you know, there was a big challenge there. But they did eventually move them, and now they d they really love their building. So that's that's a nice story about mm -hmm. consultation and about using art and architecture combined to make a space that can become a home mm -hmm. for reluctant um, law lords. And I think that that's a great story because, by the way, I mean, I now this is you know what. I do as a teacher with uh, with Pier Vittorio already, but I mean I also have a past, past as a very commercial architect, uh, and I and I think that actually what you're saying completely resonates with my experience in that not it's not only about accommodating the wishes of of our users, uh, but it's also about imagining new uh, wishes and also imagining new desires, imagining things that maybe we have not formulated yet, and offering them a possibility to come up with these ideas also in the future, not only fixing problems but also opening up. Uh, something that is uh, yet um, unforeseen or that we don't, don't really know about. I had this interesting um, uh, thought, well, thought when, you were, uh, when you were showing the work of um, one of your students, um, actually really brilliant, I, I would love to be in that unit actually, <laughs> uh, but the, which is this huge plate, it was, I think that was in, um, in, in Korea, Korea. Yeah. yeah. And it fun it's funny because it reminds me of a park uh, of course, there are no there are no trees in it, but mm -hmm. the park is this kind of idea of a, a, a form of public space where anything can happen. Um, but the, the the challenges about parks today is that they're designed for a public that existed, you know, 150 years. Say London Park, exactly. which is, you know, designed for 150 exactly. years ago. So actually, there's very little that exactly. you can do in a park. You can't even have a barbecue nowadays. Mm. So what what does a park yeah. look like today? And maybe it looks something like this. I think that that's uh, actually a super interesting comment because one of the reasons why we went with this kind of totally flat uh, surface, like almost like, uh, imagine like an uh, ice skating rink, let's say, mm. but it's just, it's concrete. It's asphalt actually, in fact, is exactly that uh, throughout the 80s and the 90s, uh, all the main uh, squares, so to, uh, of course we are now applying uh, you know, a Western trope to, to Seoul, so mm -hmm. we cannot really talk about squares, but let's say all the main open air urban spaces in Seoul have been all transformed into parks by mm -hmm. the government, uh, precisely because they want to bring back this kind of idea, ideal citizen. This is, of course, a Western con yeah. construct from like 150 years ago. And that's what they want, because they obviously they don't want demonstrations. And mm -hmm. of course, there are con constantly you know, huge demonstrations. Like you know, the average demonstration in Seoul is like a million people in the streets, literally. Very, very, in a way, very polite, because obviously they are you know, incredibly you know, cultured uh, and you know, nice people, but uh, politically very violent in, con in terms of concept. So of course they, you know, the government doesn't want that. 
they really they don't want open air public space. Mm -hmm. So the only trick that we could think of uh, was imagining this platform as something that would be sold uh, to the client, that is the state, as never empty. It's always going to be full of kiosks, mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, um, kind of fair of this, fair of that, uh, retail, market, and blah, blah, blah. But the reality is that once you take everything out, that's exactly the space that they don't want. They, they don't want a place where the, where the crowd uh, can be represented exactly what you were showing before, actually, mm -hmm. with the Washington Wall, no? Mm -hmm. they, they don't want that. They don't want that moment of political representation where we can show on TV one million people in the same space uh, uh, at the same time protesting. Um, so then they put a lot of freeze because then we can bring back that kind of uh, citizen that is, you know, it's a European construct. It's, you know, it has all kinds of problems because it comes from, you know, as you said, you know, 100 years ago. So I think it's actually a really interesting, uh, interesting problem for us as urban designers. And, uh, yeah. Maria, I want to cut you there. So I, I want to take a few more questions. Who else? Uh, would hello. Good, uh, um, good evening. And thank you for the talk. Um, my question is, um, this is open to all the panelists. Um, what is your specific definition of citizenship, one? And two, with the changing kind of interaction we have as humans in terms of communication, in terms of the way we see things, where do you see the future of the idea of citizenship and the way it held, holds in architecture and spatial design and, and design in general? So that's basically what I want. Please go down the line. Elsie, do you want to start? Um, yeah, no, thanks, Aviv. Nice to see you here. <laughs> uh, it's a great question. And I think that um, going back to the idea of palimpsest again is that the, the, the new phenomenon, the 20th century, 21st century phenomenon of um, social media and that act interaction with public space. So the idea that you can set up an event through social media, through Facebook, through um, the internet, and then have that manifest in a public space almost in a matter of minutes or seconds, I think is a really fantastic and exciting and completely unanticipated event, which it makes sense of public spaces and parks in a new and exciting way. Yeah. <laughs> That's a really good question and, and really, really broad. Um, I don't know if I have a specific definition of citizenship. I, I, I think, um, <coughs> well, I mean, the, 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 the dictionary gives us one. And, and, and it's not to make jest of that, it really matters, and it's becoming mm -hmm. to matter more and mm -hmm. more, kind of materially, physically, bodies that matter, and matter in space in very different ways, um, geographically, um, and uh, in their capacity to move, and their capacity to be present um, in, in multiple ways. So I think citizenship, whereas one might have in a decade ago be more optimistic about a kind of cosmopolitan of, um, global emergence and this notion of kind of the transnational public sphere through social media and these other spaces, um, it feels like that move is now starting to have to retract and start to try to hold ground in different kind of ways. Mm -hmm. Some that might be pr progressive holding grounds and others that might be kind of these sudden gates and borders. Um, so I guess as someone from sociology who wants to think about citizenship in multiple kind of ways and meanings, um, I'm always reminded from kind of legal colleagues that there is there is a citizenship that matters in very precise ways um, al alongside other modes of engagement and, 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 and community construction and the like. So I guess I, my contribution would be to be mindful of that, of that mm -hmm. and, and how it's being reenacted today. As a person who has emigrated <coughs> something like four times in the last 15 <laughs> years, uh, uh, I have found out that actually my right to emigrate som somewhere has to do with my labor potential, so with being able to work in a place. Uh, and I don't know whether this is now good or bad, but this is the basics of what I, as a migrant, actually have uh, learned, you know, Switzerland, then Romania, then the, the Netherlands, and now here. So that gives me to think, as, uh, going back to Asif's point, actually, that we go on replicating models and ways of thinking that maybe come from like 100 years ago, where actually your citizenship had to do with census and gender, and now it doesn't anymore. It has to do with our labor potential. Which I think is good because obviously in terms of actually, you know, class and gender, I would be already out <laughs> of any other definition of citizenship a hundred years ago. But it also, of course, raises other questions. I think in this relationship between politics and, uh, and the economy, uh, which is a big question. I think it's a big question for all of us. And I think it's also a big question for us as architects. And if we are not able to actually take on that challenge, uh, 
we will be unable in a way to, to respond. So I think, you know, I would go back again actually to the question of engagement that, uh, that Aziz was uh, asking himself before. And I think the question of social media for me falls within that broader agenda of other as architects trying to make sense of this new, uh, perhaps weird, but, you know, different way of talking at system shifting. Um, <coughs> yeah, it's, 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 it's really tricky because there's a, there's a question of what we feel it means versus what it, what it means in yeah. a kind of legal sense. Um, it's a very good question. Um, but it's, I was thinking about I the opposite of citizenship, which is statelessness. Mm -hmm. And somehow we, we can really understand statelessness, like we can feel it. And so maybe it's, it's good to define, s if we think about defining citizenship by what it doesn't include. Well, um, it might be it might be helpful, um, but I think we we understand the sense of belonging to something, um, and belonging to something uh, in a way that we are empowered to change it if we don't like it, and the and um, um, the relationships between the kind of the state and the individual, the individual and another individual, and the individual and the group are things which are. Um, um, are open in a way, um, and that that's something which which uh, probably I, f I feel citizenship uh, has in it. But something that's completely going sideways which, uh, is I read about something called the four flag theory recently, or four flag something it's called, and this is an idea which is a, it's a it's a kind of neoliberal uh, idea of citizenship where n like nationhood doesn't matter anymore, but you go to countries or you become they try to seek out. Um, multiple citizenships on the basis of kind of um, economic value. Yeah. So there's a sort of idea that you should you should be you should have one country for um, for play, and one country for as your bank, and one country for your work, and one country for your rights. And this I think this is more or less what it is. And the idea that sort of get it's 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 um, it sort of represents on one hand everything that's awful in the world, but on the other hand. Uh, maybe, maybe it sort of suggests also like the individual should be empowered to kind of um, pick and mix the form of citizenship they want and where they get it from um, today, particularly with, with all of the kind of electronic tools that we have. Mm -hmm. Maybe we have to construct our own version of what this is at the same time as acknowledging the kind of what it is in its basic form. Thank you. I think we have time for one more question. Hi, I would like to hear you about what does it changes in terms of the professions of creating a space to be more participative? How does it change it for planners, for designers, and here for architects? How does it change the profession for you as space creator? Or yeah. can, you, can you say a bit more about that? I'm not sure I quite understand. So uh, let's say like when the, like the tradition of creating space in the design, architecture, and planning, mm -hmm. uh, the professional are always been the people that are in charge of doing those transformation and the, uh, the ideation and the creative process and delivering it. As now we try to crowdsource many ideas from different type of people, try to do some engagement with different people, try to see who will use the space, why they will use the space, and try to understand the people and all the agency through that. And as like going to different conferences and working in those fields for a while, I, I kind of see that there's a shift in between how the people practice their domains, uh, how do the process that they're doing through the ideation phase to the delivery phase changes really how they act or how do they perceive their self as a professional, the professional who used to have all the power of this creation. And now this power is kind of going through different other networks. So I'd like to see in your, uh, when you work, how does it change your perception in your creative process? Anyone like to answer a question? Does it change? Like, I think all of us can. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Maybe I'll start again because I'm not an architect. So then <laughs> I can get mine out of the way and <laughs> listen to people actually involved in projects. But I, I do wonder about like a participatory form of like sociology. Well, I guess sociology does engage with people. But, it, but in, in different ways. And, um, but <coughs> I guess I couldn't speak about how that might affect an outcome or design because I don't design. And so I don't know what that process is like. And I don't know what it means to engage um, in a process of actively designing space nor having a public engage with me and what that would mean. Um, but I, I would think it, despite or in spite of its 
positive or negative or neutral outcome in our design process, um, it would always be important to me, I think, because design and architectural, architectural professions are by their nature linked with historical um, conditions of power and access to education or pedagogy, mm. et cetera. And so, um, taking your second word, bravery and diversity, the notion of being able to bring in other voices, mm. maybe they're useful or not for design, is, is perhaps important and, and in, in terms of thinking about the continual need to, to either devolve expertise and or try to think about it in more um, varied and, and inclusive ways. Well, um, I think increasingly I think about um, design in terms of an orchestra mm -hmm. um, and making, making work is more and more like making music and, you know, being, being given a score which might be one side of A4 and then finding yourself with a with a team of really expert, a bit like musicians coming together for a, you know, for a gig or something, you know, and having to improvise and having to work together until you get the thing right. But also knowing that if you don't get it right, then your audience isn't going to be very mm. happy. <laughs> you know, so it's that sort of um, starting with a, almost like with a blank sheet, with a little bit of you know fear, um, thinking we have to do this, and we've got, you know, we've got till nine o'clock the equivalent of you know half past six nine o'clock at night to get this thing out there and to make people happy you know so i mean it's a new thing for me but increasingly i think about making work making architecture as that sort of process so actually not knowing where you're going to end up but having the confidence to know that you and your colleagues together have the skills to do something and make it right you know so i mean i don't know if that's an answer but you know yeah, that's that's I might I might add something to to, to, um, to um, in a way to Adam's point about um, the I, I think the, the the position that the architect is in traditionally is a really privileged one, and I, I speak from the ar architect's perspective that the uh, and you have um, you have control you have a budget assigned essentially to a project that you can create, um, and if you if you kind of um, if you get that budget to work in the right way, the, you have the client's ear, and the thing will get built. I think. I think the. Um, I think in the past, when we imagine like the great successes of architecture, we've always thought of it as um, convincing someone to build something that looks a certain way. It's always about. It's mostly about kind of the aesthetic of the project, and that's. And that's when you you know that the architect and the client had a good relationship, whatever, because they listened to the architect and he made it look that way or something. But I think the, um, it feels like the opportunity, the, the second opportunity, which we didn't think about so much, but I think there is, it is there, is to think about um, that you might throw the brief back at the client. Once you have their ear, you say, well, what about, why don't we make the ground floor completely public? Or you know, <laughs> why don't we change, why, why, does it, why don't we make it twice as high? Let's make more money. And because uh, I have a way we can make more money, and we can use that money to do something else, uh, which is this second tower next to it, which is completely public. Or you know, you, you actually can uh, can use your creativity to to um, not just for the way something looks, but the way it works and the whole yeah. process stuff I was talking about. So I think, and I think the uh, I think that first step of having the clients here is a step to kind of. To that engagement, and I think we need to know what potential there is in mm -hmm. our design process. I think we've kind of unrealized it's not, yeah. we don't take advantage of it. Um, mm -hmm. And I think if we, it's not, it's not wrong to lead. And people often say, oh, designers um, can't change the world, all this kind of stuff, right? Or, you know, it's not up to architects to save uh, <laughs> architects for humanity, or whatever, all these yeah. kind of things that, um, and, but it, it is a really special position you're in, so why not uh, help to do your small piece? Mm -hmm. Um, and then guide the client who <coughs> might, not, might not know better or might not have thought about it. From a very pragmatic point of view, we also have new tools um, in the last, mm. let's say, 10 years. I mean, we have softwares like BIM, for instance, uh, where you, know, you don't have only one, have one person driving the process, but you have more like a kind of blockchain, in a way, process mm. where different actors that can go from the client 
for the engineers, uh, to us as designers, to the interior designers, all working at the same time on a model that is by now not only 3D, but is really 4D. It looks already to maintenance, uh, to second life of the building, and so on and so forth. And, and this is a tool that is being implemented more and more. In most of Europe, actually, uh, we will be forced uh, very soon, actually, to submit building applications uh, that are made with BIM, so already with, uh, with a view to the, you know, the life of the building and so on and so forth. Let's face it, most of us, as we are really not that good at <laughs> using it, yes, but it's coming and, and that will be the case. And I think that there's a huge, actually, discussion on this problem of BIM, uh, uh, both in the, I think, in the, uh, you know, between uh, practitioners, but also in the academic community, because a lot of people actually say that this will be the end of the architect as, you know, that, you know, male, white person that is like on, to on top of the pyramid, kind of handling uh, all these other uh, lackeys pretty much, you know, below him. Um, I think it's a big question mark because I think both the people who are too enthusiastic about it and think that really this is going to herald a completely horizontal participatory practice uh, and the people who think that this is a disaster because we're going to have complete anarchy, you know, with mm -hmm. no sense uh, of aesthetic uh, coherence and so on and so forth. I think that, I honestly don't think that in either of the two things is going to happen because on the one side, the architect is not going to disappear. It's going to be the person who manages the software, who orchestrates, in fact, mm -hmm. actually. Mm -hmm. So I think actually the figure of the orchestra that you, um, that you actually propose, I think it's absolutely fitting and it's going to be more and more and more like that. And we know that by working in offices, in fact. And of course, instruments like BIM are only going to do that even more. And the orchestra obviously is not kind of streaming along uh, you know, on its own by mm -hmm. default, but it has a conductor, it has a score. So although maybe we might not be the person who actually throws uh, stuff, but there is still going to be an agent uh, there um, who is the curator. So in a way, I think the, the people who think that it's going to be completely horizontal, um, I, I don't think that that is really going to be the case. I think that there's going to be still some kind of direction. Uh, for me, there is a more like, you know, hidden political question in there that is that I do think that we as architects, uh, let's say the Western architect that we still more or less all are somehow because we are trained unfortunately in this kind of hegemonic culture so there's no way out of it for the moment i mean we are seeking a way out of it but it's still there um what did i want to say ah yes um we are we have been invented somehow socially to create differences uh, to create asymmetries uh, to create brands uh, to create uh, aspiration to create uh, style to create language all the things that actually you were describing before and of course, we all we all want to liberate ourselves of, of that mandate, but that mandate is still very much there. So I think that until that mandate is there, until capitalism is there, pretty much, mm -hmm. uh, let's say that, I don't think that we are going to disappear completely. We Maybe our role is going to be different. It's going to be that of leading the orchestra, for instance. Uh, but I think actually the discussion on these new softwares, to go back to the question of social media, I think actually the question of technology is very relevant, not only in terms of the way which we communicate the, the profession, but really the way we design. We don't design like that anymore. You know, like the, the five of us would be working in the same office. We would be tackling the same 4D models from different points of view, and it has to be taken into account. So. Mm. Great. Thank you so much. It's a wonderful sort of variety of answers to that question. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Do we have time, Rihanna? What time? <laughs> okay. One more quick, quick, quick question. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, um, my name is Claudio Capullo, and by the way, um, it's not much of a question, it's more like a vibe. Okay. Um, as she says, like, um, as a Western architecture, she says, like, you create, like, a language. Um, I was thinking more of, what, of his project in Brazil and the project that he done in, in thing, the Old Street. So um, I was thinking, them sort of projects, don't you think we should create more uh, in, in, in develop developing countries and so so we can build build more of a society and build a language for those people? Um, yeah, I mean, the, the there's definitely a kind of, um, it was a weird situation because I think we were, bunch of architects and students from quite a, from a relatively privileged background going to Brazil and kind of, you know, erupting on the scene. <laughs> so there's a complexity there, right, about um, one point of view and, it, and the danger of imp imposing your ideas. And this is the important thing about trying to let something grow in some way 
uh, it's incredibly important to let let them grow out of something lo out of local way of thinking, which probably we didn't do it as if it was the first thing I ever was involved in that's built. Probably didn't do it that well, actually. It could have been a lot better. Um, uh, but um, yeah, I mean, I mean, this is, this is. I think there are a lot of architects w who are working in this field, uh, which are worth which are really worth looking at. And I don't know. I mean, your your um, uh, who whose kind of mandate is to provide um, to in a way to enable people's points of view locally. I don't. Um, I don't was it wasn't really a, a question you were asking, but um, so I'm, I don't know why I'm trying out to <laughs> 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 I'm floundering. But uh, um, I think what would be quite interesting, though, is if a, uh, if a Brazilian bunch of students came to London mm -hmm. and said, this is our idea of public space, how would you use it? And this, this correspondence is probably something mm -hmm. we should be doing more of, rather yeah. than it's always exporting uh, our idea of it. Mm -hmm. yeah. So maybe that's what's what we should do next. Mm -hmm. yeah. Great, thank you so much. Okay, I'm so sorry we have to wrap up this new time. But um, if you have any uh, questions for the speakers, um, you know, there might be sort of a few moments as everyone's packing up to sort of run up to the front and, and ask them. Otherwise, um, I'm sure they'd be more than happy for you to get in touch with them and and ask them to maybe through email. So uh, thank you all so much. I really appreciate that. Thank you all for your questions. Um, <laughs> it's been a nice